Samai Flinch from Innovar Technology, which is, as I've learned, um, stem from the closing of the Alcan Bambury Laboratory, and you made a big company out of that. Please. Thank you very much. Well, this is going to go down well. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for inviting me in to speak today. And uh, oh, um, really great opportunity to be here. And I'll share with you some of my thoughts on what the future of metallurgy might look like. And I'm going to do it in the context of kind of innovation as I've learned over my years in, in industry. So what I'll do is just say a little bit about myself, just so you can sort of get a sense of what I've done, where I've come from. Um, I'm going to quickly go through, because I think we've had some great examples over the past day and a half of the history and uh, of the, the, the timeline that Brian presented nicely this morning, I think uh, has really set the scene there, but give some examples of why metallurgy has been crucial for innovation over the, uh, over the years. A little bit of a, a reflection on the current state that we find ourselves in and, and why we need to do things differently going forwards and then plant three seeds for change as I see them before making a few closing comments. So, here we go. I'm not going to go through all of that. You can see what I look like. Um, the interesting thing I'll pull from this, I've never had a job title that has metallurgist in it. I spent 25 years, 30 years probably now, working in materials and in the metals-based industries. The one word that I think has been sort of consistent and prolific throughout that time is the one that you can sort of see in green here, innovation. And that's really the theme that I want to use to sort of take through the rest of this presentation this afternoon. And that really sort of brings me on to the things that get me out of bed in the morning and motivate me. And they're sort of captured on this slide. What I like to do, what really excites me, is to try and find this sweet spot where kind of technology, science and engineering mix with humans and things that work well for businesses and, and generate income, wealth, revenue, that sort of thing. So these are what I'd sort of probably list as my, my key likes and skills that I've developed over the years. Now, apologies to, uh, to Peter for, for screwing up some of his content, but I, I wasn't supposed to be speaking now. I was originally on yesterday morning and I, <laughs> and I swapped slots with Mark, who couldn't be here today. Um, and I was originally going to sort of talk about how I can give you some examples of metallurgy-driven innovation leading to sort of good practices in business. But then as I was absorbing the, uh, the debate and the discussion from yesterday, I sort of came to the realisation that I really need to sort of flip that around and turn it on its head. So I want to sort of take a slightly different slant and uh, really sort of say, rather than how can metallurgy inspire business, how can business best practices and innovation management techniques be used to sort of set a new course of path for the metallurgical industries, which meant I needed to rewrite all my slides, which meant also that I did that when I got back from the bar last night. So we'll, we'll discover over the next 20 minutes or so whether that was a good idea. <laughs> so, oh, something else that excites me, that, that little element number 13, but uh, we've heard enough about that over the past couple of days. So some examples of metallurgy driving innovation. Before I go into that, and I, I do lecture and teach undergraduates on, on innovation, um, anyone brave enough to give me a definition of what they consider innovation? Gosh, I didn't expect this, uh, this amount of silence. But, uh, it means different things for different people. Bernie. Yeah. Sorry, once upon a time, I, I asked the same question. Uh, and he actually felt that it was science plus engineering equals technology. Technology plus marketing equals innovation. In my mind, Bob got it wrong. He missed one equation out. Science plus engineering equals technology. That was great. Technology plus design equals innovation. Innovation plus marketing equals wealth creation. That's too complicated for me. But Very good. You, <laughs> That's, that's, that's often uh, the word that I hear. No, it's not. Um, it's not. Uh, there's plenty of innovations that don't make money, and they can be very good, and they can be very bad. 
Well, that's that, that's where I think you and I might fall out over the next few minutes, then, Brian. But my favourite definition is that innovation is actually the process of turning knowledge into money. Um, well, well, well bear, bear with me. <laughs> so it's a shame that Mark Madovnik's not in the audience today, but uh, I'll just sort of say reports of the death of consumerism have, have been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> so I'd expand that a little bit more and say it's not just the, the green dollars, it's an expanded definition of value, wealth, prosperity, which I've got in the... Uh, the title of the, of the talk here and people that know me know that I'm really not that mercenary so I think it's really important that we um, recognize that we have a duty to leave a positive experience in the communities that we operate and leave the, the planet in a better place than, than we found it and I think all of those can be derived out of value wealth and prosperity and what that means but just as a little little aside that definition of innovation Innovation is not the same as R&D. It's fundamentally not. In fact, you could argue that R&D is the reverse of that process because it usually involves quite a lot of money and you generate some new knowledge. So I'd say innovation only happens where you've got somebody that's prepared to pay for that new concept, whatever that is, a product, a service, something that you can deliver. So with that in mind, bringing us back to the future of metallurgy, um, I just wanted to sort of share a bit of my experience of companies that are good at innovation and what they do and why and how they're successful. One of the things that's really, really clear is that if you want to get a good new product or new service, you need to start out with a lot of ideas. Um, and I see too much and I've seen a little bit of it over the past sort of 24 hours. People get very passionate and very committed to their particular material or industry sector, there's enough important and exciting work for us all to play nicely and for us all to be doing some, uh, some really good stuff together going forward. But this, this concept of having lots of ideas to get the one winner out is, is really important for innovative companies. Um, and this other thing is, uh, you know, so just sort of putting that into perspective, the management processes that you use to turn ideas into successfully commercial products and services usually they get divided into something called a stage gate process that's an example of one um, and it's all about managing that flow of an idea becoming something that's got a, a value at the end of it and just sort of putting that back into some language that you guys are probably a little bit more comfortable with <clears throat> There, you know, it's, uh, you know, the ideation, the discovery side of things is a little bit like your, your nucleation. As you build up those uh, business cases and justification for why it's a good thing to do, that's a little bit like growth. Hammering those ideas into shape, I sort of liken to, to thermomechanical processing, really. But getting them ready for the real world and letting them loose on the general public, that's where we need to be really disciplined and have lots of uh, um, measured testing and evaluation. Then, of course, once it's out in the real world, there's things that we can do to, to check that that thing that we've developed is still good and still safe and uh, fit for use. So that's really a, a quick tour through, uh, through what is innovation, what it means to me. It's a personal view. There's lots of different definitions, as I said. But just some examples of why metallurgy is brilliant and why it's so, uh, so important. And I think it's an enabler for innovation. So these happen to be examples from the aluminium industry. Um, but you can find examples from all the other metals. Um, the thing about aluminium that I love is that, you know, a material that you can, you can get for free when you buy a fizzy drink can also transport you safely from one city to the next or from one continent to the next. Um, you can put all your digital soul in it and your, your laptop looks fantastic. To do all that is not really a technical achievement, but to do it economically and, and make commercial products that people want to buy, that's really at the heart of innovation. And just to sort of put a bit more bones on that, I think one of the greatest examples of innovation from the 20th century is the, the growth of the aviation sector. And I, I, I think that's a great success story for the aluminium industry. And picking up on some of the themes from the last two days, real world experimentation. So in, on the beach in North Carolina at the beginning of the 20th century, when uh, the Wright brothers were experimenting every day, 
What you may not realise, it was only when they switched out their cast iron engine block for a cast aluminium one that they were able to get the, the weight reduction that they needed and to become airborne. So that was 1903. Um, and in the years that followed in the 20th century, the, the commercial aviation industry as we know it today, and I really enjoyed the talk this morning, by the way, about the, uh, the propulsion side of things, but to get from two brothers on a beach doing some real-world experiments to making whole commercial businesses about transporting freight, transporting people, going from continent to continent. It's a fantastic achievement and a real innovation success story. And if that wasn't impressive enough to, uh, to then land with the, one of the, I guess one of the earliest aluminium intensive vehicles, the, the Eagle Lander on the, the surface of the moon, that was only 60 something years after the Wright brothers experiment. So really important to sort of, not lose sight that things start with real world experiments. Okay, and, and all of that, all of those advances came because in parallel, we were able to design, manufacture and ex exploit the properties of aluminium alloys, particularly after Alfred Willem discovered uh, precipitation hardening and that allowed us to then push the boundaries of alloy performance through the 20th century. And there's that direct correlation between the growth of some of those those larger aircraft structures that you saw previously and the yield strengths that you could get from certain aluminium alloys. And this is a, this is quite a famous uh, sort of plot. And th this is really sort of personal to me as well. And in the early part of my career, I did uh, something a little bit similar to this, but on a much smaller scale. Some of you that know me know that I was in the compressed gases industry for a large part of my career. And I was involved in developing alloys that could be used for, for safe, lightweight gas containment. So in particular, pushing the boundaries of 6,000 series and then 7,000 series aluminium uh, alloys. Um, I'm going to really rattle through these quickly, but it's a great story of how you get something from a, an idea to something that's safe and successful in the real world. Um, it starts with real world experimentation. We did it at the lab scale, first of all, but putting in lots of understanding of how you generated what looked like it was going to be a suitable composition, microstructure set of properties. And then we took that to the, the real world manufacturing process. Um, we didn't call it this at the time, but um, digital twins. I was doing simulation of the uh, of the manufacturing process itself. I'm not sure. Could you see if those animations will run for me, please, at the back? If you click on either of those two sort of images, there you go. So, I, I, as part of my own PhD, I developed a simulation of the the extrusion process that these were made by, and then the neck forming process that followed it. And then I took that one step further and developed a kind of microstructural model. Sorry, could you just click on again just to see what happens? There we go. That's broken it, hasn't it? There we go. So developing some microstructural models that allowed us to better predict the performance that we'd get from these products going into the real world, which, which are really, really safety critical, heavy, heavily regulated products, by the way. So even when you get to that point, you've got materials that you've made on full size presses. You've got products that have passed certain lab tests. You've still got to get it accepted in the real world. That whole validation stage of, um, of, of the innovation cycle is absolutely critical. And that's where the industry our industries can do a much better job of speaking with one voice, lobbying, legislation. I spent years sitting on ISO standards committees, getting new test methods adopted so that we could show that these new products were going to be safe. Um, and I think that's all part, a key part of the exploitation process for new materials. But again, starting out with the lab scale process. But then really hitting home, when you see these products in action, you see these, anyone who sort of sees a sporting event in the UK in particular, when someone gets badly injured, a paramedic's going to run on with one of these cylinders, and that's the, the alloy that I was involved in developing. Um, and then when I sort of worked in the US earlier in my career, I transferred that product over to the manufacturing plants in, uh, in North America. Sorry, there we go. And the, the cylinders that were manufactured out of the plant in North Carolina ended up being deployed in the mine rescue when the Chilean mine workers were, were stranded um, uh, just over a decade ago and the capsule that brought the, the miners to the surface. Inside, you can see there, they brought the miners up one at a time. Each one of those capsules had four of our 7,000 series alloy cylinders. And to this day, I think technically, that's probably one of the things I'm most proud of, to see how you, what you do in a lab, what you do in your PhD, can end up having a real world impact. I think we need to get some more examples of uh, successful case studies. 
So, right, that's kind of where we've come from. Um, innovation, doing things differently, Brian. It's about change. And the, the, the simple message here is that you don't, you don't need to innovate if the world stays the same. But let's be honest, the world isn't staying the same, is it? And I think the, the events of the past sort of three, five years in particular have, uh, have probably seen more change than any period before that. So it's all about change. And I think what I've seen over the course of my career is it's not about necessarily making something bigger, stronger. It's about doing something that's right and adapting to the environment around you. So responding to the fact that the, I forget who said the, the phrase yesterday, it's not a climate crisis, it's climate vandalism, someone said. But we, we need to act and we need to act quickly. I'm not going to go through some of the data. We've heard that lots of times over the past 24 hours. Um, but again, it's not about being clever, it's not about being smart or being the biggest and the strongest, it's about adapting to the environment around you and that's at the, the, the ethos of innovation as well. So what do we need to do to change? Change the batteries in this clicker probably. There we go. The first thing, we've been talking about it pretty much over the, the, the last day, decarbonisation, this is some examples for the aluminium industry, it applies to all of our sectors. Aluminium is going to grow quite significantly over the next couple of decades, 50% from where it is now, driven by specific sectors, construction, packaging and transport. We've talked about some of the specific requirements there over, the, uh, over the, this conference. Um, sustainability, we cannot escape, but we need to be doing it for the right reasons. We need to be taking cost and energy out of our manufacturing processes. And as we're doing that, it's, it's the right thing to do. We want to attract more people into our industries. They're the kind of messages that we need to be getting out to the public. And, you know, it's all about for the aluminium industry and some materials have, have different sort of challenges, getting more and more reliant on recycled secondary material rather than primary production and, and driving down the, the total energy costs that are in there. Sorry, can you just click on, please? And the biggest challenge of all that faces the aluminium sector is not only is the, the volume of the industry going to grow by 50%, we have to reduce the total amount of emissions by getting on for 80% over that same period. So that's, that's really forcing us to think differently and to, to apply some new technologies and new, uh, new solutions to what we've traditionally done. And that, again, and we started to touch on this, and, and Mark was talking about this, Mark Madovnik, yesterday. That changes the sort of the value, what we, what we hold true. And sort of uh, you've seen this uh, around the, the last few days, and it's on all the banners, and it's a vision that I very much subscribe to. But chatting with Peter at the start of uh, this afternoon's session, for me, circularity starts with deploying the right materials in the right application. My view is there's no such thing as a good or a bad material. You know, it's just about design, Bernie, and deploying the right material in the right application and then keeping it in use for as long as it's, it's possible to do so, developing strategies and, and techniques to make sure that you can keep it out in use and it can be remaining in safe service for, for longer lives. And later on, if you need to repair, remanufacture, there are technologies that you can bring in. But recycling is something that you do several layers into the circular economy and that's, that's something that we perhaps get a little bit too... Uh, too caught up in. But what we what happens if we do all of that is obviously that we, we reduce the, the burden on primary extraction techniques and some of the, the very damaging environmental processes that are associated with those. Okay. And this is a really nice graphic on circular economy that I saw from Ball, who's a, a packaging company that does a lot of, uh, they make these and, and other products. Um, but really, and this comes back to Mark Madovnik's comments yesterday, the value for the user and the consumer is all about keeping products out in active service for as long as possible. And that's where kind of the traditional metallurgy skills come into play. You know, those relationships between microstructure processing give us to a set of performance parameters that can help us design more efficient products. But then when we do get to end of life and we start to do more recycling, that's where the kind of work that we've seen coming out of Lime over the past few years is, is really, really critical also. So feeding that into how we remelt, design alloys that can be more tolerant to, to higher impurity levels and continue to get safe performance is, is what we need to do. And another message that I sort of took from my, from my years developing products and working on innovation 
understanding what the customer really wants and what the customer values is key. You don't have to be the best at every single thing. You know, and this is a, a great sort of quality mantra here. You can pick any two of these things, but you can't have all three. So if you want something that's going to be good and cheap, you don't tend to develop those sort of things very quickly. If you do want something that's going to be good and you want it quickly, it's going to cost you a lot of money to do that. So really understand, don't waste, don't over-engineer, develop the products and the materials that the, the market and the, the users need. So it's uh, coming up towards the end, and, and that's really sort of changing how in the metal sector and in the aluminium industry in particular, because they're responding to what their consumers are telling them. Um, a lot of the major producers are coming up with their low carbon uh, product, li product lines and brands. And this is all in response to the increasing consumer awareness of where their materials come from and how they're made. And uh, I think probably Jeff said in his introduction session yesterday that you know the global average at the moment is something like 16 tonnes of CO2 emitted per tonne of aluminium produced. We've got to do better than that. And we know the ways to do it. And we just, just need to now deploy those. So this is a little bit of a, a quick one-slide one summary of, of what we need to do to become more sustainable in the aluminium industry. And it's, it's a little bit of a, another product development marketing mantra, the, the sort of the good, better, best model. We can be green-ish today. We can adopt the sort of the current best practices of, about getting our primary material from, from regions that are, are not using coal-fired sources, for example. We can be uh, continuing to push the boundaries of getting more high recycled content materials out there, building on the work that's been done at Lime and, and the partners and the Constellium program in particular. And that's uh, setting us up with a really solid foundation to do things better going forwards. Um, but longer term than that, we do need to continue to drive down the, the production of primary metals, continue to, to seek more use of secondary metals wherever we can. Um, but the other thing I see that's going to change, that needs to change, this has come up a couple of times, Particularly for the UK, we import a lot of our engineering and structural materials. That's fact, you know, we don't have the, the onshore production capacity anymore. But we're still one of the world's largest consumers of a lot of these, these metals. I think always in the top 10 consumers of aluminium. But when that product comes to the end of its life, it then goes off in a shipping crate, goes back to China, gets remelted and gets reprocessed again. That's crazy. We need to understand the value of the end-of-life product, retain that value, process it locally, and get it back into circulation in a, in a leaner supply chain. And I think that's really what's going to change in the coming years. So that's kind of the, uh, the quick talk through the, uh, the, the value perception, and that's something that I think we're already starting to see in, the, uh, in the, the aluminium industry. But final comment, really, is all about the future sustainability of us as a metallurgical community. Um, the one thing I've learned over the years is that you can have all of the metallurgical understanding, the intellectual property you like. There aren't that many businesses that live and die on metallurgical relationships. Success and execution is all down to people. You've got to bring people with you on this journey. So I think we need to do a better job of continuing to uh, attract people into our industries and not only do things as a little closed huddle, but be, uh, be um, more open and collaborative. And I think the, the, the work that's come out of Lyme over the past 12 years has been a really fantastic example of that. This kind of brings it a little bit home to, to Innoval's perspective. Innoval's a small player in the scheme of the, the global aluminium industry. We're proud to have been involved in uh, a, a large number of these collaborative programs now with some of the sort of the flagship partners that you see there. And that's the way of the future. You bring new products to market more rapidly if you've got partners on board that have been there, done it before, or can help you get there more quickly. So people, it's all about people. And I think it's important that we look inwards at ourselves but do a better job of making sure we've got a future pipeline of talent. Martin Jarrett had a, a couple of slides on the pipeline of talent and what it means to Constellium. I know in the, the conversation we had yesterday afternoon, Pam was sort of talking about how important it is to kind of engage with the, the public at large and, and sell why it's so important to be in the metal uh, metallurgical industries. And, and to do that, I think 
showcasing why metals are important and what they've contributed to society so far is really important but being more diverse uh, the, uh, in, inclusive in our sort of recruitment policies and the people that we engage with is really important as well challenge yourselves are we doing everything that we can be as I, as I stand here and I look out towards all of you I don't think we've done a bad job over the, the past couple of days if you look at the makeup of this audience but if you look at the line of lineup of speakers if you look at the makeup of the advisory boards I, I think we could do better now I'm, I'm pleased that Ulrike is following me but Ulrike is going to be the one woman that's on the, on the entire program we need to do more to make sure that we're getting views from all all aspects of the, the population and that does create a more innovative dynamic working environment for everybody so just uh, wrapping up now all about people as I've said so we've probably been through a lot of these points already um, the metallurgical industries have had a strong tradition of driving innovation in some major industrial sectors as Phil Withers said yesterday morning it's a, it's a line that I uh, roll out at every opportunity I can there has never been a more important or a more exciting time to be involved in materials science and engineering and, and metals are a key component of that uh, that discipline um, We've got to recognise that innovation doesn't stop. We've got to do things differently, particularly addressing the, the, uh, the climate and the sustainability challenges that exist. Getting more people on board, being more open, more collaborative will help us get there more rapidly. And diversity. I've, I've said my piece about EDI. But also, let's learn from each other's materials. You know, there are too many people that are happy to say that I'm aluminium and I don't like steel. We can learn from each other embrace best practices from different sectors and uh, that will help us uh, get to a better place as well so all in all a lot of stuff's gone th gone by in the past a lot of important and fun work still lies ahead of us so this point came out yesterday as well but let's take control let's help shape the future thank you very much much inspiring talk um, I'm just wondering uh, I think you showed also some graphs um, which the prediction for the need for aluminium will increase for the I mean until 2050 I think this is what uh, Dirk Rabe was working on or he published on and well if we account for all aluminium that exists and we have been produced so far that would be about one third, if, um, if, I, if I remember correctly. So we will still need to have production of primary, alumi uh, primary aluminium at least by 50% or, or, or about that. Um, and we all know that is, I mean, producing primary aluminium is, is, is very energy intensive and has a high carbon f uh, fingerprint. Yeah. What are your thoughts about that? How ca can we... Um, change that I mean is there is there future is there perspectives to uh, uh, attack the primary I mean the production of the, the the carbon footprint from the primary production of aluminum. yeah there absolutely is but I think Jeff hinted at this yesterday a lot of those technologies have been in development for decades already and they aren't they aren't available yet my, my view, my message is that we cannot achieve those growth rates through more recycling alone. So we have to decarbonize the primary side as well as promote more use of recycled, high recycled content alloys. Um, there's a lot of data that sits behind some of those market projections that sort of takes into account the impact of the pandemic and uh, sort of post-COVID recovery rates. Uh, they're all showing the same thing, that demand is going to be 50% more than it was you know, at the beginning of this, this millennium. And to get to there, you need to continue to get primary aluminium, but we want to maximise the use of recycled metal, secondary metal. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, sh we should, we should Im improve or maximise or optimise that as well. Uh, but I think that's, it cannot be the only solution there. We need to yeah, adapt yeah. A, a, a And that's about, I think, in the very first session, 
yesterday that Brian was chairing. It's, it's and, 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 you know, you, and that's that's my point about innovation as well. You don't just have one idea at the beginning and run with that. We've got to be throwing all our best resources, our best brains, uh, everything we can. One of the things I can sort of share with you about the innovation process is that you need to quickly understand which solutions are going to work. Ones that are not, you kill them off and then you put your resources into the ones that are going to be working. So, yeah, we need to do lots and lots of different approaches. So I uh, want to make an observation that I've seen uh, a lot of major uh, companies in the United States and, and in the UK um, back in the 60s and 70s had their own research centers where they generated new ideas and innovation. And those are all closed down now. I talked to a vice president of Ford who was in charge of research, and he gave a talk on this, uh, on how uh, Ford innovates, and it was really dis discouraging to me. His idea was if Ford has enough cash flow, we buy anything we need. And moreover, we buy it so that no one else can use it yeah. because we had invested capital in our existing equipment, and we want to get all of that capital back in profit before we innovate. So uh, unless we can change that attitude of industry, um, you know, our, our environment is, is deteriorating and industry has to come up to the plate and contribute as well. And so it's not the short-term profit, but the investment. Uh, and I, I don't see this happening in industry. And I don't know how to change it, but, you know, everything is driven by the short-term yeah, profit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Labs from Group, etc., were all closed, and the CEO of this company said, Well, innovation is in that. First, I'm an engineer, Peter, I'm an engineer, and second, we buy it. Exactly the same attitude. And he closed a wonderful research lab working over 50 years in steels. Perfect. Gone, and the knowledge is gone. And I think that's where having tighter relationships between industry and academia can help restore some of that and embracing kind of the power of collaboration because uh, I think a lot of that longer term visionary R&D is probably now taking places at, at university and, and sort of research centres but it, it needs to be joined up is my message but. Or, or is it you outsource it from yeah, yeah. to BCAS yeah <laughs> and, and that's that's what the automotive sector does as well doesn't it yeah Thank you for your presentation. Thank you.